What's going on? Welcome to another episode of the Behind the Wheel Podcast. I'm Scott from Koenig, Jared from Koenig. We're here. We're doing this whole thing again. Uh, when you're watching this, it's Wednesday. Yeah. If you're watching this, it's a blessing because we've had more technical dif- difficulties than ever before. Anyhow, we have a really good guest, and I want to get into it. Um, we don't – I would say within the amount of guests that we've had, we don't often – get to go into the road race time attack world no we, we've done it plenty you know with with chris and james houghton and um and we've done you know some things here and there we had savannah on you know we've we, mm. we've certainly you know kind of went to those relationships just for whatever means it seems like you know we don't get that opportunity a lot so i'm really excited because there's some people that are are avid you know um i would say i it gets tough with the whole pro level thing, but there's mm-hmm. there's some things that there's some people that are you know avid NASA or SCCA members and they're out there and they they put a lot of time in and I don't want to devalue what their programs are, mm-hmm. but then there's people that actually climb and reach certain heights and and our guest today, uh, Tom O'Gorman, is certainly one of these people, um, and I'm gonna let you start coming in here because I try not to sound ignorant when we do this stuff. Um, I also acknowledge that this is not my strongest suit. Um, you know, I'm really familiar with grid life, very familiar with a lot of NASA events, hyperfests. Um, but when it comes down to like some of the IMSA racing and some of the pro racing, I'm not huge into that world. So you're going to have to guide us a little bit. It's all good. First of all, thanks for having me. And I think that's actually maybe an interesting topic to talk about because I think that's the case for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been uh, it's been a pretty wild ride over the last 15 years in motorsports, especially the last five or six. And uh, I'm just having a good time, <laughs> to be honest. I'm just yeah. trying to drive drive cars and, uh, and enjoy myself. And it's turned into quite a career um, that I'm hoping to just, I used to joke, I want to have to decide when I get to retire from racing. (laughs) I don't know that I'm necessarily in that boat anymore, but you know, that's all I'm here to do. No, I can appreciate that because it's, you know, there's some things in life. And I think a good equation to this, to the average person would be a baseball, professional baseball player or a professional boxer. You could have the love and the passion to do these sports and you can, in your height of your career, you can almost feel that this will never end. I could never stop doing this. But at some point, your body, your mind, your physical ability, it will tell you it's time to stop or slow down. Yeah, for sure. And I kind of use the analogy of sports, uh, you know, to, to, I guess, an extent, we are all professional athletes when we're racing in professional series. But I use the analogy, like, if you could pay a million dollars to be the quarterback of an NFL team, regardless of whether or not you get snapped in half on the first, you know, the first tackle, you could do that and you could be the, the, the quarterback of an NFL team. That's kind of how some, a lot of pro racing works. Um, so it's definitely a little bit of a different, um, I call it business racing sometimes too, because <laughs> it's, it's truly half about that as it is uh, your skill set in the car and whatever else you can accomplish yeah, when that you're is, physically racing. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. And, and we've alluded to it in a lot of different podcasts i think when we talk to different drivers Mm -hmm. you know we've said to people like uh you know some of the pro the formula drift pro drivers and pro two drivers you know are you going to make the jump up to pro you earned your license and it all comes down to well if i can find the money to do it so it's all dictated by the ride that you can sort of get through somebody else's pen yeah, to an extent. And right. and there are certainly ways around that to it to an extent as well. And yeah. I feel pretty lucky, I think, to be maybe an example of that kind of outlier case. Maybe it is an outlier, but I don't come from a ton of money. I never really had a I've never had a financial sponsor, really, um, other than the years that I raced for Honda, if you consider that, but I was more of almost an employee than I was a sponsored driver, I guess. Um but you can still make it work. And I think you gotta you gotta work a lot harder in a different way, but you still got to meet people. You still got to go to all the events you can get. Uh, you still got to be nice to people. You probably have to be nicer to people, <laughs> which shouldn't be that hard, but maybe it is for some. Right. Um, and it, it's going to take longer too, but that's part of why I've been enjoying so much of what I've been doing now, because even though I'm not racing in a pro series and have the IMSA pro license in my wallet or whatever, I'm racing in a career way on this stage that's appreciated by a ton of people 
and I'm sure we'll talk about it. Obviously, I'm talking about grid life, but yeah. it's uh, it's got all the same aspects of pro racing when you boil down what is pro racing. We have the broadcast, we have the media, we have the fans, we have spectators, all of that stuff. But it's in an attainable, appreciable way that I think, to your point that you made at the top of the show, maybe pro racing doesn't always have that because even people within the motorsports industry don't necessarily know what's, what's going on in IMSA, but they probably at least, you know, had seen the grid life content or been to an event, something like that. You know, for me as a, and I'm somebody that's been in motorsports in some sort of way for as long as I can remember, it's how I got into cars. You know, I started out drag racing. I don't want to give anybody the impression that it was any good, but I started out drag racing. And I think that, you know, from somebody I've done, uh, autocrosses. I've done time trials. I've done uh, a lot of different things. Again, not very good at it, but um, I've also been given a job that allows me to continuously be around cars and support motorsports and a lot of different forms of. So I think it's interesting that you find these sports where people – can be in the same type of industry segment of cars and different things, but rarely understand where that break is between what's considered professional or not. Sure. Um, I guess you could, I mean, there's so many ways you could define it. I guess some people would say it's whether or not you're being paid to be there, which that kind of falls apart in the driver's world because a lot of drivers are paying to be there but they're there in the series and their license says pro. So then there's the definition. Do you have a pro license? Well, yeah, you, you kind of do. Um, for me, I was always focused on longevity and I, I don't really know who I thought I was or why I thought I deserved to try to get into pro racing. It's just like, it was something I wanted to do and the, the natural progression just started happening pretty quickly. Um, from the time that I basically decided I wanted to try road racing in the first place to the time that I realized that there was an opportunity to race my, at the time it was a Honda Fit, in pro racing to okay i need to raise a little bit of money so i did a crowdfund campaign and then that just snowballed all of that stuff happened so fast um but to back to your point you know i started pro racing a honda fit and people are like oh you race professionally that's really cool what do you race oh a honda fit what? like right. <laughs> okay so is, is that pro racing you know it's, it's so it's so different from everything else but the reality is i've still made a living within motorsports and automotive stuff for the last eight years and i don't plan on stopping anytime soon so hmm. i would consider myself a professional in motorsports whether i'm a professional driver or whatever i don't really care you can call me whatever you want <laughs> yeah so a uh, real quick i want to because i know all right, so let's be honest. I know most of your story from what I've heard from friends, but friends that I have earned uh, through this job, through this position. I, you know, I, the the James Houghtons of the world, and and people that that know you more intimately than I probably would, except for randomly seeing you race and, like you said, the live streams and some of the broadcasts and stuff like that. Sure. I know that you have had a pr – and I say this in context, but a pretty darn interesting and successful career in, in this segment. So I guess my question is let's talk for just a few moments because – and I don't want to spend the whole time on it because I think anybody can go to any other podcast or – you know, research you and come up with this information. But let's take people up to speed. How did you get into cars? How did you get to kind of where you are today? Sure. Yeah, I can definitely do the abridged. Yeah. That, that could be a whole, sure, <laughs> a whole thing on its own. But uh, basically, I uh, my dad is a car guy and always had kind of fun cars. He had Mustangs and I guess Supra in the 80s and some stuff like that, RX-7 in the 80s. Um, and he found going to mid-Ohio sports car course as a race fan in the 80s. Uh, when I was born in 91, he started taking me when I was a little kid. So I've been going to mid-Ohio since like 1993. And we would just go to every spectator race we could possibly go to. But we were never participants until um, my cousin Sean, who's about 10 years older than me, he, he um, found autocross somehow and introduced us to autocross. And my dad and I both did our very first event as participants together in my dad's Miata. And I got super into the autocrossing stuff because I could afford it. I was like, I basically quit all my extracurriculars in school and started working so that I could 
like pay for people's entry fees and I never really owned my own car. So I got introduced to the national level of autocrossing and people would let me drive their cars and stuff. Um, my dad fell away from that. He liked driving on track more. So he would maybe do like a track day or two every year. But mine started with all of that national level autocrossing. And at my peak, I was probably, meaning at my most autocrossing, I was probably doing like 20 to 30 um, autocrosses a year. And most of them like the, the national level. Yeah. So I was traveling constantly. And that's like all I emphasized until I won my first national championship after seven years of trying. Um, I realized like that's where the road ends with autocross. So you got to try something new or be okay with that. You're never going to, you know, that you're, you know, an autocrosser for life. Yeah. Um, and I'm still an autocrosser for life, but I wanted to try something else. So that's when I had saved up enough money to buy a road race car. Um, I had built enough of a, a resource bank within all of my autocrossing because you know how it is. All the world's so small. Yeah. Uh, everybody who's at the autocrosses is still at the road races and still, all of that weaves together pretty, pretty well. So I had enough of a resource pool to like ask the right questions, have people be able to kind of connect me in the right ways. Um, you know, they, they kind of waived my licensing process because I was so experienced with autocross and then kept an eye on me. And there's little things that because I'd spent so much time in autocross and gotten really involved, um, I had more access, I think, to, to different things like that in motorsports. Um, and that's when my parents kind of came back in as, as well. They were like, oh, we can go to the track and we can like help you keep track of the car and help you with the schedule. And like, it kind of became this family thing that my dad would come and then my mom would come and then my dad bought a race car. And now all of a sudden we were this racing family that we were going to, you know, five or six club races a year. And that's when I decided I wanted to try the pro racing stuff. So I bought that Honda Fit, had friends that had the resources, meaning they'd been pro racing in World Challenge in B-spec cars like that Honda Fit. Um, to help me find little shortcuts. Like you only need to buy two tires a weekend. Don't buy eight. Every other team in the paddock's buying eight. This, these guys only buy two, rotate them through the front of the car and you know, um, or like that. So basically the, the first 10 years, I would say of, of heavily autocrossing and starting to club race, uh, then pivoted really quickly into the five years that I was racing um, as a contract driver for Honda and went from crowdfunded into two weekends of beast back in Pirelli world challenge to racing full-time in IMSA. So that all happened. Super <laughs> Man, that is crazy. Do you, do you hear the yeah. bouncing? Hey, Tom, something's is bouncing. I don't know if it's, is it a cord that's bouncing against maybe. the desk? Maybe, maybe. Uh, oh, I see, the, I see the mic extension or something there. I think that's probably yeah. walking around. That might is that be better? it. So, yeah. If you hold it in your hand, that's oh Got maybe it. what was that no i don't know <laughs> I think is it still clipping yeah i think you're no i think you're fine yeah okay I cool think when you were talking before i think the, the thing was bouncing was just... against the desk yeah i think i might get too animated <laughs> yeah no 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 animate animate that's fine perfect uh yeah we're good all right we are back to it so I think it's really interesting that you were able to have such a good context of racing with your family. Do you think that that was a little piece in the puzzle for the enjoyment, the fact that you could do it as a family? Um, yeah, I mean, the family aspect is is one part of it, but it became such a part of my life, like right when I found autocrossing. And like I said, I quit all my extracurriculars. Like I was in band, I was playing volleyball yeah. in high school, um, and it just became my my main thing. Um, so my, all of my friends became racing people rather than I didn't have high school friends or like the year I tried to go to college, I had these racing friends that I would ache to see on the weekends. And I would go to these events and have the best time with them and then go back to my normal life just so I could go do that again. So the family part, but then also just the community part of the entire, yeah, like the entire motorsports world that I got to know, um, just became like my core focus. Um, so that's why I found, um, you know, I was going to these events anyway, and I, I kind of learned the different things that I might want to do, but I never really thought it would be realistic. I was just trying to go to as many events as I right. could, and it snowballed into becoming a career. But um, it was kind of interesting. When I, The more I got into pro racing, I actually found that I was one of the few pro drivers that would go to motorsports events anyway yeah. without being paid to be there, without being, like, forced to be there. And I was one of the drivers that wanted to stay at the track longer than I needed to be there. Like a lot of them would clock out as soon as the last session's done, they're out as soon as you finish the debrief with the engineer or whatever. Like I wanted to be there, excuse me, and I would be going to these events anyway. So I think that's partially why I was able to find 
to keep the motivation to keep doing these events just because I, I wanted to. Like, I think I'll have for always want to. How does it come that you can go from autocrossing and NASA events, SCCA events, to getting a ride in an IMSA vehicle with with not a not a low lying team? Yeah, man, I wish <laughs> I wish I knew how to bottle it and like this is how you do it. But it's right. uh, I think I got. I mean, I'm incredibly lucky. The timing just through the entire path was perfect. So starting back at step one, like I was talking about with the Honda Fit, there's only like three years or four years that a Honda Fit was even eligible to race in pro racing. But I was I, I was in that little moment. So instead of having to pay tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars to race on a weekend, I was paying like three right. because the car was so cheap to run and the class was so basic. Um, so if that didn't exist at that time for me to get into pro racing at that time, I wouldn't be here. Um, or you know, maybe I'd be here, but I wouldn't have done the other thing. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. uh, those, those, um, those little things that like, they just happened to be the right place, right time kind of thing. Um, the next part was when I won my first championship, Honda had loaned me the car that I was driving. Basically I pitched to them, like if, you know, me and this other guy take this car, um, and we try to win the season, we'll pay for everything. Just loan us the car. Cause we knew they had it. Right. And at the end of the year was when the new 10th gen civics were coming out. So it just happened to be that they, were wanting the new 10th gen civic to hit in the next season of pro racing and they needed somebody to do it. And they basically came to me and said, do you, would you be uh, interested in doing this? And I'm like, what do you mean to my interest? Of course, <laughs> I would absolutely love question. to race this new car. Yeah. But if it had been, you know, in the middle of the 10th gen civic run and they didn't need a, a debut for it, same thing, I wouldn't have been in that position. So I got very lucky with the circumstances along the, the timeline of those five years to just be in the right place at the right time. And then always being focused on doing a good job for the people that were giving me the opportunities. So for, in, in a lot of cases, that was Honda. But in, in general, I always wanted to do a good job just because I like doing it. So now that Civic, did you also – like? because at the same time, did you campaign that in SRO? Yeah. That was a, at the time Pirelli World Challenge, now SRO right. um, TCA car. Okay. So, just, man, I – I just can't – I'll tell you, and it's recent, so I guess whatever. I just can't get the images of watching you take the NSX from Honda for for a while and, uh, I mean, win events with it. You borrowed a car, you won events with it. Yeah, that was a surreal experience. Uh, so that was only – what did you say? If they're listening to this, it's Wednesday. <laughs> that, fe that feels <laughs> like it was only Wednesday. Monday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, this was very recently. So, uh, unfortunately – my my time with honda was cut short as far as racing goes just because um my, my contract lapsed while we were closed for covid and it just never worked out to restart that up so yeah. they kind of they kind of let me know that it was going to be a while and then maybe it's not going to happen and all this stuff so that's fair that is what it is but i didn't have anything really going on in the timeline after that that contract wasn't renewed so um first i bought a race car my honda s2000 which you guys so graciously uh have oh it's our pleasure yeah, I, yeah my wheels are on there your wheels are on my car um but then also i i saw these uh, big autocrossing events start popping up and like i said i started with autocross and i like i will always always love autocross there's something about it that's like the biggest hit of adrenaline it always makes me want to go back and I was given the opportunity to autocross an NSX back in 2017, and I found out that it was actually really, really freakishly good at autocross because it's hybrid front wheel drive, combustion engine rear wheel drive. So you have this instant pull out of the corners, and then you have this supercar with 500 some horsepower. Uh, and then I saw these big money events start to pop up. The first one was, you know, UMI's King of the Mountain, uh, and then Optima tried to top them. The first ones were paying like 10 grand for the winner, overall winner. Uh, Optima did 25 grand. So this year UMI did 25 grand as well. And I'm thinking, okay, so I know NSXs are really good. I have the PR guy's phone number. Maybe he'll entertain this idea to go take it and try to dominate these events and showcase how good this car is. Um, and I got very lucky that they agreed to that. So they sent me this car, trusted me with it for three weeks. We put like 3,500 miles on a press car and I don't know, two dozen autocross runs. <laughs> and, uh, won both events basically uh i didn't win the the, shoot, the shootout of the first event but we were the fastest car at the first event won the national champion at the second event so it's pretty cool well, so, okay. well i was yeah. just gonna say i want to speak to something specific that you were just saying earlier which is 
uh, you said that with autocross, there's such an adrenaline rush. And I heard that and thought to myself, how, how is that even remotely possible compared to the road racing that you do when you're literally wheel to wheel, door to door? Yeah. I wish I, I, I don't know how to describe it any other way than like, you know how when you do like 10 burpees, you're like ready to fall on the ground. Like you, like you physically can barely get up off the last burpee, but oh, if you Tom, run, I, I don't know <laughs> I, you know I what I mean? love what you're talking about. Right. So that's like a jump start. It's just like hits so hard, even though you've only done it for like 15 seconds or 20 seconds versus a, a marathon or a, you know, a 5k takes, you know, 20, 30, 47 hours. I don't know how long it takes to run because right. I don't run, but, um, there's something about that short intensity hit of an autocross run that like you get no breaks. You have to be inch perfect all the time. There's no straightaways to reset. Like, yeah, there's some heat of the moment stuff that happens when you're wheel to wheel racing, but then you get a break to stop thinking about it, or then you get a break to come right back down. So the chances of you actually finishing a race with a high, with a, with a shaky hands, like, holy cow, that was so much fun. It's like a quarter of the time as when you finish a good autocross run. Yeah. It's so much fun. No, that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm still stuck on the NSX. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why. Is, let's do a little general car thing here. Um, so as a car person, I think if you're – all right, if you're somewhat in my age bracket, if you have been into JDM legend-type cars for a long time, there's no doubt that you've probably driven um, an NSX, an early NSX, right? I oh, have. We're, we're about the same age, and I haven't. So, <laughs> well, it sucks for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but what I mean is, it, you know, you could have driven those cars. There was actually a fair number of them produced. Sure. The new NSX is not the case. There right. is far less of them. They're way more expensive, um, and the truth is, most likely you're. Not many people are going to get a chance to drive one. I know I sure haven't. Let's talk car stuff for a second. How good? I'm not talking about racing. We know that you can win with a car racing, but how good is the car when you drive it on the street? How good of a car is it? Um, it's shockingly good. <laughs> it's it's so weird because it's an Acura, right? It's like you said, it's uh, at its roots, it's a Honda, but it's still a supercar. So it's kind of in this in between space right. where it is extremely exotic, extremely rare. You're not going to see them on the street very often. Even at like you go to Cars and Coffee every weekend for a year, you're probably still not going to see one. But it still has you know the center stack for the gear shifters out of a TLX. So it's like a very it's a very familiar experience to be in the car and it's kind of surprisingly easy to forget that you're in a supercar when you're driving it around. Cause like the visibility is awesome. Weirdly. Um, like the, the car just drives really nice. Um, and then you put your foot down and like every single time you put your foot down, the hybrid helps you launch just a little bit. And then all of a sudden you're going like 120 miles an hour and you remember that you have almost 600 horsepower and the car is really fast. Um, whereas I've been fortunate enough to be in like a new Ford GT or like, a like some Ferraris and things like that. And it's really uh, hard to forget that you're in something like that for better and for worse sometimes, right. if that makes sense. Like sometimes they're a little annoying and sometimes they're clunky and they're hard to see out of and you get nervous, but you just, I got so comfortable with this NSX driving it around, like I said, like 3,500 miles, most of it highway, but it's just like, holy cow, I can totally live with this car. Yeah. It's an interesting point that you brought up, you know, to me, and I don't think that they're on the same level. And I, listen, I'm a big fan of these cars, but but don't kill me for all the fanboys out there. But the closest thing I think I can equate it to would be like a GTR, a new R35, you know, like an R35. It's a Nissan. It has yep. Nissan elements to it when you're in the car. You know, it, it, there's not – it's different. I'm not comparing the same. But if you were to go from, a, you know, a 370Z into an R35 in 2010, 2011, you could feel that translate through a little bit. Um and you're, it's, a, it's an incredibly good car on paper. I mean, and in person, it drives very well. Yeah. But it's not, you know, you're going to have people that will try to equate them to, let's say, you know, certain Lambos and R8s and stuff like that. And I don't know that I think it's 
all there. I mean, I think it's close on some levels, but driving that Honda, you know, driving an Acura and having that familiarity of the cockpit, the controls, and still having an Acura or, or a Honda badge on the car, it is a weird feeling. Totally. And I think, like, I would love to know from someone who was around when, like, when the R32 and the NSX were both coming out in, like, the early 90s. Like, that's, like, both 91, 92, right? Were those cars that could perform way higher than any Lamborghini or Ferrari at the time, for the most part? Except for, like, in maybe an F40, maybe? I don't really know, because I'm too young. But that's what I want to know is, have they always been that way, or is that, like, a new car yeah, that's- uh, problem? It's an interesting point. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you. So, so the R32, I think, came out in '89, and mm-hmm. I, I think, on a time comparison, the car, especially like around the ring and stuff like that, I think the car laid it down incredibly well. But you're right. I mean, the car had no creature comforts. This wasn't a luxury car. It wasn't an exotic car. It was a Really cool upgraded car, but still a Nissan. Well, it was a performer, right. is I think the best way to to put it. You know, yeah, what I mean? but like it wasn't. Uh, do you? Th- I don't even know in that day that they would have been compared to one another. Oh, you mean an R thirty two and a what a Ferrari F forty? Yeah, well, well, no, oh, not an F forty, not an F forty, not an F forty. Like a Testarossa or something. <laughs> yeah, but and so the gentleman's agreement also kept those cars lower on the horsepower range they're in 270 so horsepower wise they probably didn't measure on paper as well either but it's a super yeah. interesting point i mean that's why you like the original nsx was the poor man's ferrari right isn't that what they kind of called it yeah i guess if you're gonna buy like a ferrari 488 now which i think is like over 300 grand or an nsx which you can get for like 150 to 170 I guess it's still kind of that. It's just the scale. <laughs> yeah. It's obviously way different. <laughs> it is incredible, though, because when you think about the original NSX, I think my biggest complaint with the original NSX was the fact that it didn't have the power for the engineering that was there. Like, that car was incredibly – it handled amazing. It drove well. It never – you can drive an original NSX and never really feel like it's out of its element, but it didn't have the power to support it, whereas – some of the other cars had the power and the new NSX clearly has that power. So yeah, you know, the translation's there. It's pretty wild working at so many events. Now the, 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 just the opportunity for performance out of the most basic cars. Now, like if you go and buy, I think you can get a Camaro SS for like what, 30 or something with the V8 and a little higher, but yeah, a little higher 35, I think maybe, um, those cars are unbelievably good. And it's like, it's not an expensive car, but the, the performance ceiling because of the power, I think is what you're talking about. Yeah. Like in, in whatever, 91, the NSX was probably putting like 250 wheel horsepower to the ground. Whereas a new Camaro is easily over 400 horsepower right away. Yeah, And you pay like half of what an NSX is, an old NSX is worth now for a Camaro. And all of a sudden you can go crazy fast at these track days. Mm-hmm. Like the opportunity for performance out of modern cars, whether it's, an NSX or a Type R or a Camaro, or whatever, it's crazy just because of all the power creep and tech creep. Right. I think it's an interesting point. I think what's also interesting is one of the cars that I think is super underrated for being used in motorsport by the average enthusiast to me is an EcoBoost Mustang GT. Ooh. You know, it has the ability to really tune that car. It's got the turbos. It's got, it comes with Brembo's brakes in the front, optional rears has incredible aftermarket support. And I think that there's just a ton of things that you can do to improve that platform out of the box. Yeah, for sure. And like you said, you can get like crate motor stuff for a 2.3 and then you can, I mean, they have aftermarket support, not aftermarket, I guess it's all factory stuff. You just, I wouldn't wouldn't be surprised if that's one of the new go-to, you know, it's like K-swap everything right now. If that's like put a 2.3 EcoBoost in, uh, in everything in like 10 years or whatever. Well, maybe it, I should keep the Baja and put a 2.3 EcoBoost in it. There you go. <laughs> I have to bring this up every podcast. It every drives podcast, him nuts. he's got to <laughs> insert his BS Baja into it. Anyhow, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's hard because I'm like a 
I love the K series. A K24 to me is just an incredibly in, just it's just an a really well performing transplant. But man, the extent that people have used some of these engines in ruffles some feathers. In what way? Well, Who, because what I, I got to tell you, you get you, all the guys, which I think is a great swap. All the guys that are putting them into like boxsters and and stuff like that, they're oh. like really pissing people off. <laughs> Have so, you seen the? Isn't there a, a Lamborghini? Uh, sorry, a Ferrari. What like a three hundred eight? I was just going to say, yeah, Mike from Stance Works. Mm-hmm. That's what I was just going to add. Like, imagine the people that are getting pissed off by that thing. Yeah, I, I think I'm one of them. <laughs> I mean, that's what I, th- I think I'm supposed to be one of the people that's all for it, but I don't know if I would actually do that. <laughs> yeah, there are some things, I, you know, and I've always been, I, I'll be honest with you, I've done a fair number of engine swaps in the course of my little build crusades there. I really, for some reason, maybe it's I'm just enough purist, I really start to get an itch when I start to take um, a non-OE uh, transplant and put it into a different make. Like, you know, like a two JZ stuff maybe is my, an LS, maybe the two platforms I feel like I can shift. But when I take that Honda motor and put it into a 240, I do get that little bit of an itch, even though it's really good move for it, you know? Like you feel a little dirty. Yeah. Like, oh, this is, yeah, yeah I understand that's, that. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> But I think How do you feel about putting a, like anything other than a rotary in like RX-7s? Ooh. Where's your stance on that? I, see, I have a very incredible love-hate with the rotary. So like, <laughs> I like the fact that it was so different. I like the fact that it, on its premise, you can make some really incredible like three and four rotor builds that would just blow your freaking mind apart. But the 13B on its own merit was... You know, okay. So, Fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've personally taken FD cars and put 4G63s in them. So, I don't know if I'm like, I think I already screwed myself. But if I had just known how much those cars would be worth then, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I know. I spent my whole day trying to get, trying to get all these cars that I can't possibly afford anymore. Missed the boat. <laughs> I had a Camaro two years ago, so if I sounded like I was partial, I was a little bit. Yeah. That I wish I'd never sold because I'm like, first of all, I'm never going to have a nice car like that ever again, I don't think. <laughs> uh-huh. But but think of what that car would be worth now just because of how much more. I just had two friends. They actually had a, a, a ATSV and a Camaro, and they sold both of them back to the dealer for more than they paid for them, having had them for three years each and put a bunch of miles on all of them. They're like, we just had two free performance cars for three years. Yeah. That's no. that used car market situation. My God. It is insane. Yeah. Absolutely insane. And I'll tell you another great car that as it depreciates even more and more is going to be an incredible buy for somebody. Those CTSVs. Oh, yeah. I love those things. They are cool. Just anything on that. Anything on that chassis is, yeah. is really, really solid. Yeah. I drove one when I was at Jalopnik. That thing was, oh, this thing was so cool. I know. <laughs> They're great, and so are they. Like so are like a lot of the C six Corvettes. Like I want a C six Z six really bad. They're awesome to drive. Yeah, I don't know what I mean. GM does some really good stuff. Obviously, I'm a Honda guy, and I have yeah. driven everything Honda. But the, the GM stuff, when you're talking about performance driving, like spec, unbelievably good on track. Yeah, this the C six Z six is like one of those cars that for some reason, and it's not about. It's just the affordable one. Like I, C7s are newer and C8s obviously are, to me, still too up there. But great cars. But um, but that C6, for some reason, really hits hits in the gut. I don't know. I want to talk real quick about something you spoke about earlier. And when you said you were more like an employee when you were with Honda. So... Let's walk through that for a second. So you get, how does it start that you essentially get to be an employee uh, of HPD, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. And 
what does that feel like? So, so they offer you they offer you a seat, and I guess what they pay you a salary. Um, I was like a 1099 contract employee. Okay. Um, so it was, it, it was interesting. It was never about being a driver. I was an athlete. Um, and I had like a, a marketing agreement is essentially okay. what it was. It had very little to do with actually driving. Um, and the, the racing stuff was not, it wasn't specific to that. It was more like just an overarching agreement that this is the terms to your contract and the services you provide and the services I provide, um, back and forth to each other just like any other agreement that you'd have. Um, but yeah, it was to drive, it was mostly to drive race cars, which was the most surreal thing ever. Um, so yeah, they, they, they grew over the couple of years that I was there. The first one was uh, just a simple marketing agreement or athlete agreement, I guess you would call it. And then as we grew together, um, they, they obviously asked more of me and then um, the relationship grew from there too. But uh, yeah, it was, it was really cool because I never, I never had to play by pro racing rules. Basically, if you go back to the original conversation about how pro racing works, I, I didn't have to play by the, those rules. And it was just by circumstance. Um, I was playing by different rules. Obviously, I was uh, essentially a factory driver, although we, I don't know where the line for that to be called is. That's fair. Um, like, I, obviously, I'm being paid by the manufacturer, but I'm also racing a, a low level Civic. So I don't know where you start to be called a factory driver. Right. But what was cool is, um, oh, I just lost it. Uh... I had a point and I lost it. I think you were talking about just the paid aspect of being able to go to these events you would probably go into anyway. Well, yeah. And and also I think it opened me up to, um, or maybe it was a perspective that I came in with maybe is because I wanted to go to these events anyway. Obviously there were the races that I was going to. That was the coolest thing that I never thought I'd get to do. But there were all these other events that because I had this exposure to grassroots racing um, and I knew the events and I knew the people, um, I started to learn that that there were a lot of, opportunities for Honda to kind of plug into those things and their window was through me. So they didn't have to necessarily go to SCCA and sponsor an event, or they didn't have to go through different um, routes like that. You would normally have to, as a partner, they would do it. You know, they loan me this NSX and go, go to a couple of events for, for a couple of weeks and they get a showcase at that level. Um, and I don't think a lot of, I don't know that many people in pro racing would have the experience or the exposure to grassroots to even think of those things. And a lot of times I was coming to them with these ideas and they're like, we don't get it. What's it? I don't understand. Like you want to go to autocross? What? And it's like, no, it's a big deal to a lot of people, but I have to convince them of that. Um, so that was, that was more the angle that I always took is like, how do I, how do I make a genuine representation for these people who are giving me this awesome opportunity back at the events that I want to go to? And then also selfishly helps me go to those events too. <laughs> it sounds very symbiotic. You know what I'm saying? I feel like when it comes to like these marketing agreements or whatever, usually one person has a little bit more of an edge, so to speak. And I feel like what Tom is saying is it's it's very symbiotic. It's very give and, give and take. Yeah. I, I listen, I think that a lot of giver relationships if they're if they're good are a give and take and they don't have loaded issues on one side. I think the difficult part, like Tom was saying, is that he almost had to convince them, let me go expose, um, you know, this platform, this racing to, you know, to the grassroots community. Let me go back to where I was. It will actually help pay things forward, which is hard because I think from a company like, you know, Honda and HPD, they probably are just super in their bubble. You know what I mean? They're here to race. They're here to build these incredible cars. They have factory back. They're very focused. And to almost have to envision it being used in a different fashion, I think, just becomes a, a little bit out of the bubble for them. Yeah, it's out of your it's out of the familiarity for sure. So like if I went to the the Acura PR guy and talked about Daytona, he would know what I'm talking about. But if I go to talk to him about SECA Autocross Nationals, it's like, okay, what's that? And it's not like they don't care. It's just they have to get a perspective. And that's my job to present that perspective and also share the value of it because it is a different value, maybe not for an NSX, but for, you know, for a Civic, if I'd have brought a Civic SI and won the class, you know, next year, there would probably be 20 civics on the grid because, oh, that guy can win. And 
if I got that car, I could win. That's, you know, yeah. that's totally the grassroots mentality. So if you're showcasing that this is what, this is what you need to win. Uh, and they didn't always get it. Like sometimes it was a harder sell than others. So it's like no harm, no foul. If I'm, you know, just bringing all these ideas and the, the coolest part was they have all these assets sitting around. So I got my, my opportunity to start with them because I knew they had this Honda fit mm -hmm. that was only built to go to SEMA and show off the new B spec kit for this car. And it never turned wheel in competition other than one other time. Um, and it was just this thing that they had sitting and it was like this, this other guy, David Daughtery and I had the idea, like if they would just loan us that car, we can do everything else. Hmm. And that day they bit and there are other days that they didn't bite, but it was always, okay, how do we, how do we take all the resources that are already there and make something cool out of it? You, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take as Wayne right. Gretzky would say. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and you also have to understand that when you work with Honda, when you work with HPD, these companies are in a whole different political arena. They oh, yeah. they have politics that that exceed even the most active employee there that's your supporter. So sometimes it doesn't work. We worked with Honda a bunch. We we were the first ones to get well, one of the first ones to get uh the 2000 six si when they when they came out with that car um we got it in 2005 for sema we had it for a couple years we helped them debut the a, uh the crz um oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. you know we've done some things with honda and hpd the cool parts about those builds is when they want you they really open the doors like there were so many things we had access to uh mm -hmm. you know HPD parts. We had access to a whole bunch of aero and different things that were in Japan that hadn't come out yet. They brought them into the country for us. They, you know, they gave them to us to bring to SEMA. Uh, our car was in their booth a couple times That's at so SEMA. Cool. These guys are on a different path, but you have to understand that internally up in that office, there's an agenda that they have and you don't know what that is. So, Tom can only make a pitch for what he feels is right. And then whoever's in charge of controlling the key is the one that has to then decide if it fits into their agenda. Yeah, actually, I asked for an NSX last year for that first $25,000 event because I knew if we go and we do it right, like that car can win. It's not going to win right away. Like it's not a cheat code to win, yeah. but that car can absolutely compete. And I went through a different avenue to try to get to it and it fell short at some point and whether it's because the wrong per or not the wrong person, but a certain person didn't want to ask another certain person to make waves in the office. Like you're saying, it's like, it's Tuesday. Is this fight worth picking yeah. versus in me? It's everything I want. And that's the only thing I can think about. And I want it so bad. And I'm trying to convince them of it. It's like, sometimes they're just not going to work. So it was really interesting and positive experience to be exposed to all that because otherwise I had a pretty um, solitary path. Like I was not really doing anything. Uh, I wasn't working an office job. I wasn't doing anything like, I don't know, corporate or partnership driven or anything like that um, until that. And I had to learn it, but I also got my hand held through it as well. So it was like a good, okay, how do I exist in this career? How do I exist in this world um, without the consequences feeling quite so high? Because they were always super, super transparent with me. And they were always also so um, inclusive, I guess. Like they made sure that I felt welcome rather than feeling like I was on this island. Um, and I, I even found out afterwards that I was the first, you know, they've obviously had drivers for years and years and years and years, but I was the first driver that was actually on contract with Honda racing, not through a team, not through something else. Those drivers still probably got paid through Honda, but it was a way more, you know, work it through this way route. So I always existed in this little space. It was, I was the only contract driver for Honda at the time. Um, and that came with positives and negatives. Sometimes they didn't know what to do with me. And sometimes it was like, I got to do the coolest stuff ever. Yeah. So but what does that look like? Do you have regular hours? Do you just show up to you? Like they send you plane tickets and you go to these events, meet them there, and you're kind of there to do whatever they need you to do and drive and then you'll stop. And like, how does it work? Sort of. Um, I, so like I said, it kind of grew, but it was getting to the point when um, the year that my contract wasn't renewed, I was on the schedule for a bunch of PR events that I was going to go to like Long Beach and drive NSX hot laps right. for, for media and just like stuff like that, that I'm thinking, how in the world am I even going to get the chance to do that? That's the coolest thing ever. And it was like me and a couple IndyCar drivers, like to be included in, in little moments like that, or, um, 
I went to my home race at Mid-Ohio when IMSA went there before I was racing at IMSA, but I was in World Challenge. And um, I gave an interview on stage at this like fan thing uh, between Mario Andretti and Peter Cunningham. Nice. I'm like, no one cares about me in the middle of those two guys. But, <laughs> yeah. but for me, like on, my, on that little lineup, that was crazy. Yeah. Uh, but back to your original question, um, I had to get myself everywhere. That was part of the deal. Okay. But um, yeah, they would have certain events. Like I had to be at, uh, I mean, I was obviously defined that I had to be at the races I was supposed to be at, <laughs> but then um, just certain deliverables, pretty simple, straightforward stuff. Um, and then I was always, always, always searching for an opportunity to plug, plug into more mm -hmm. um, and also not cost them more money to do it. <laughs> that was the, that was the balance is like, how do we, how do we do more and how do we go as many places as possible that you're not already at without, Obviously, I don't. If they're if it's going to cost them fifteen grand on no notice, they're not going to do it. So, so as disappointing as it is, like you said before, they said they may not renew your contract again. This may be the end of the professional driving athlete arrangement that you have with Honda. What's yeah. next? Where where do you think you're going next? Well, I was always first very, very aware that this could be as short a ride as possible right. or as, as it was. Right. So I, I, the one thing I'll give myself credit for is I was always cherishing what I was getting to do at the time. Which is great. Um, but as soon as I knew I wasn't going to be renewed on the contract or racing that year, I had bought an S2000 within two months, <laughs> for better or for worse. And now that's the race car that I drive now. So um, it started back in like 2019, Grid Life. Um, launched grid life touring cup which was their first wheel to wheel series yeah. and it was totally different from other club racing in that we race four times on a weekend 15 minute races are shorter and it's basically like if you were to turn on gran turismo and like screw off on a championship where you race three or five times real quick and then you're done in an hour that's essentially what we're doing um and i was one of the original like commentators for it and all of my friends started racing in it um and i was always in its orbit but i never had my own car and i even got to race a couple of races here and there just in other people's cars, but I wanted my own so bad. So that was like the perfect opportunity. Once I knew I wasn't going to be racing in IMSA or somewhere else. Um, first I needed to like, if I'm not racing, I don't feel like myself. So I needed something <laughs> and it didn't last long for me to need to you know, find this S 2000 and, and pick that up. But um, it was also the exact place I wanted to race. And what I've come to appreciate is that it's the perfect balance, I think, between club and pro racing, because we have still the broadcasts and we still have so much media and they have ticketed events where there's, you know, thousands of people there. I mean, you've seen yeah. what the events look like versus if I were to find another place to wheel to wheel race that was not professional level, I don't think I would be able to maintain um, the level of exposure to the world that I have. Um, which is cool because someone like me is making a living in this career. I need to be visible and be out there and be seen and have some, some cred. And I think it's the perfect series for that. So I got pretty lucky that that existed right when I was, you know, needing somewhere to blow off steam. <laughs> so I think it's in grid life did an amazing thing. Chris and those guys, uh, starting GLTC, allowing, um, wheel to wheel racing be a gravitation for their series, I think it's a huge a uh, monumental undertaking. It's it's really almost the and then, like I think if you look at their series, you know, in ten years from now, it's going to be a big milestone in their progression for racing. When you say that you're a uh, you're still a professional uh, driver and that's how you make your living. How do you make your living now? Is it mostly through instruction or uh, different things like that? Yeah, I do a lot of my own personal private coaching, but then I also work for um, other companies basically as a contractor still as much as I can to to just pay the bills more than anything. Yeah. Um, but because of how, um, you know, my, my racing contract or my racing career um, was cut, I had to figure that out really, really fast. Right. So um, a couple of years before when I started going to grid life events and even before GLTC was around, I would go to the events to be with my friends and it would be a great time, but I never had my own car. And during the day I would end up being kind of bored sometimes while everyone else is off on track, having a good time. Um, so what I started doing is just saying like, I have experience at all these tracks. I've experienced in a lot of cars. I will drive your car and you can ride with me. And 
you can see what I'm doing. And I was doing it strictly for fun and kind of selfishly because I thought it'd be fun to drive cars. <laughs> but it also turned into this really cool thing where I would work with a couple drivers every weekend and they would always, you know, excuse me, they would always uh, talk about how helpful it was to see in the car someone else drive it the way that that they were working on and um, and then take that to the next event or take that to the next session, whatever. So I started doing that in like 2017, 18, 19, and it, it started to build up some, you know, when I walked into the event and people saw me, I would have people asking me if, if I would drive their cars. And I just transitioned that business model or that fun model into a business model of how do we turn that into actual, um, you know, tangible coaching, making sure that there's video running, making sure there's data running. It's not all about me driving your car. It's about how do we, you know, break you through to the next level in driving. Um, and a lot of times it is, I, I think I'm one of the only that really does it the way that I do with the, you're going to ride with me and then we're going to look at the, the video and data. And I tend to do it um, more on a business model for people that are at the track in a grid life capacity or in a grassroots capacity where they're not going to spend a thousand dollars a day to have a coach privately, yeah. you know, at their beck and call ready to go, but they can maybe spare a hundred bucks or 150 bucks. And I'm trying to give them the same value that that other person would get for a thousand dollars a day. But then I do it with five or 10 people at a day and business wise, it's the same for me, but I've touched a lot more people in a more genuine way. I think by doing it this way, because I have worked with professionals, not professionals, um, like pro series people. And sometimes as a coach, you maybe feel like you are just there because you're supposed to be. And it's really hard to get someone to break through. But if you're at this grassroots event where someone's just so hungry to get better and they're taking everything they have to get there and they're sleeping in a tent, but they're going to give you a hundred bucks to try to help you help them get faster. And then they have that light bulb. It's like the most rewarding back and forth. Um, so that's what I've been fostering this, like, you know, last year and a half. Yeah. Um, it's it's been fun. I I love that about you and your your program. It's one of the reasons that when I heard that you could use some help when we had the intro that it was just an immediate yes. Like we're super into helping support our industry and the way we feel about supporting industry is trying to make sure that we support as many of the people that are on that grassroots level as possible. Mm -hmm. And look, I'm not saying that you can't make selfish allegations for a company to put their name on the side of a car, right? Like that's there and I'm not hiding from it. But us being able to give product to people and support and build these long-term relationships and and let people, you know, that's the reason we do the podcast. That's the reason we do the lives that we do every week. It's not because it makes us money. It's because it gives people a genuine connection to us and mm -hmm. allows people to have that time where they can ask questions or bring up issues. I mean, it's not all the time, but like we genuinely care. We just, we just uh, dealt with a guy that I saw on, um, on a Mark, uh, one of those Mark six, Mark seven uh, Volkswagen forums. I was just cruising through there cause I do. And, um, and this dude straight up put up dash cam footage. He got, he got, he, a hit and run in the middle of the lane. He like somebody came into him, destroyed the whole side of his car, took the quarter out, the door, the wheel, the fender, and just kept uh. driving. And he's got the he's got the dash cam and he's like, Oh, my car's toast and he puts it up and I just sent him a message and was like, Yo, like, I don't know if you're gonna be able to rebuild, but if you do, let me know. We got you on the wheel. And it's not because we're going to get anything out of it. Like, I'm not sure. I'm not asking him to promote it. It's just like we're all car people. Sometimes you jump in to help. And I think that with stuff like what you're doing, you, yeah, you get something out of it. You get a little bit of money. But the person that's on the other side of that, they could be the next active autocrosser that's out there you know, helping propel the next line of autocrossers. And that's what keeps our industry moving. And shame on these companies that are selfishly not even entertaining it. They're spending all their money on the top level athletes only. Now, I don't mean that as a diss to them. I know it sounds like it. But at some point, you have to have some sort of admiration for where people start to be able to ascend to this other level. And I just think that to me is more important than anything. Well, and connecting with 
the your audience and or potential customers in a different maybe more realistic way yeah yeah I, th I think so but you know it's 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 awesome to watch what you're doing and and you know even get feedback from you and that's something that we've had in exchange email wise recently you're right. like hey look you had a uh, tom had a bent wheel or two yeah. uh and he said hey look you know is this is this the course of this is this with this i mean there's Every product innovation that we've done over the past eight years, when, you know, with the flow forming stuff that we've been doing for well over a decade, we will always make it better. And so any feedback that we get, it's really important for me to understand the legitimacy of how it happened and what do I need to do to make it better? Sure. Yeah. And that ties pretty well into back to my experience working with Honda. And obviously, like I said, I was kind of uh, in a development period with that new Civic when it came out. And then that just turned into, I needed to be really good at giving feedback all the time. And I was working with professional engineers and I'm working with people who are building these cars and the feedback I'm giving them has turned into the cars that go to like all the races now have those different, you know, changes that we made in that first year. Um, and that has tied into being able to verbalize what I need to verbalize when I'm coaching somebody. So it's like all tied together that, you have these opportunities to like pick up little tidbits here and there and like uh, any, any little thing you can pick up like that is so important uh, because you never know when that's going to be like a big, a big innovation or a big thing for someone five years later, or next year, who, who knows? Right. It's interesting. But I, before we end our talk here, before we wrap up, is there a website? Is there a place that people can go to get contact with you? Because there's there's a lot of grassroots people that that randomly listen to certain things or or catch a thing. Where can they find you if they want to take advantage of kind of getting you at an event that maybe you're traveling to? Sure. Um, the the best place uh, for sure, if you want to like type in a website and be clean, is um, the ASM website. So ASM AS Motorsports is the team I race with. We're in Wisconsin, but we go to events all over the country. Okay. Um, and they have a website, um, shop ASM shop asmotorsports.com. Okay. Um, and there's a professional coaching tab. So if you're looking for that specifically, but they also build cars and custom fabrication and all that stuff. They maintain my race car, and Andy Smedegard owns it. Does a phenomenal job with everything. Um, outside of that, I'm still, uh, like I said, growing as a business person. So I don't really have a website for myself or anything <laughs> yet, but I do a lot of it through, I do a lot of it through Instagram and Facebook and it's, uh, it's growing from casual to, to real still, but it's awesome. fantastic. Don't, we'll, don't hesitate to send me a message. Yeah, if you we'll need make to sure that we link all your stuff down below yeah. in the description. So if you're looking for Tom or you want to take advantage of kind of getting into a car and listening to, you know, a, a really solid amount of feedback. Uh, his information will be below. I'll tell you, I we've only talked through email at this point, and while I've known of you for a long time, this is my first pseudo face-to-face -face interaction, right? So yeah. I, I really appreciate your time here. I thought this conversation was – I mean, not that I didn't – I don't want to – sounds worse than it is, but I, this go. was way more interesting – than I thought we would get to. Sometimes we don't produce the best stuff. I think this was really cool. Hell yeah. Well, thanks for that. No, it was, it was a pleasure. I'm uh, happy to come on whenever. And like you said, good to e-meet you. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And one day we'll be in person without a mask. I don't know when, but you know, it's coming. Are you going to PRI? So no, um, this not year. Not going to PRI, not going to SEMA. We're not doing not. that. SEMA seems to be falling apart a little bit. I can see that. Yeah. And uh, I just don't know. I ha I'll be honest with you. I have n I've been to PRI once. I I've, it's just not a show that we necessarily get to because we're not like a hard parts company. Um, but if I can swing it this year, if, if things open up, then, you know, we'll see. Sure. So PRI is a lot of fun. It's like uh, it's like the the attainable version of SEMA instead of leaving with your eyes spinning, you just only see racing people and right. it's like, yeah, it's really good. No, that's, that's, <laughs> that'd probably be a welcome change, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm super excited. What's so what's next for you this season? You're going to grid life next. Yeah, we have a uh, last race of the season. Um, I am third in the overall championship, which 
considering my car was blown up at the beginning of the year. <laughs> no. Like I would not have believed you at all, but yeah. that's all down to ASM and, and Andy for making that a reality. Um, it's like a long shot for me to actually win the championship, but Eric Cotille probably will. And I know you guys are with him as yeah, well. So we hopefully we just keep a couple Koenig cars there at the front, but yeah, that's the last race of the year. And then the other than some one-off coaching here and there, I don't know that there's much left. So I'm going to have to figure out how to keep myself busy in the winter as a uh, professional coach for well, the first time. Simulator right there. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I'll probably play this and get mad at it too much. Fanatec. Uh, that's actually my roommates. I have a, I have a Fanatec in the other room. I don't okay. know what that is. That's yeah, a Logitech. I've been, Working on trying to put one. I have my name on the list for the new um... DD. Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah, or, or something like that. Yeah. So the the direct drive, the budget direct drive that they're putting with the boost package. Yep. Um, it's my first time into sim stuff, so I don't know. I'm pretty excited about it, but like also a little unsure what I need to put together. So I'll figure sure. figure it out. Let me know if I can help because that was my entire life all of last year into. <laughs> I get it. No, I appreciate it. But listen, thank you for doing this. Uh, we thank certainly you, yeah. screwed with your entire day, and I appreciate you stomaching <laughs> it for us to be able to do it. It was totally worth it. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tom. So, man, I was it was it's so good because I think that you know when you don't really know somebody in, in depth, you don't really know what you're going to get, right? Mm -hmm. Not as sure. far as the person. I'm just talking about as far as, you know, what you're going to cover, what's going to come to the surface. And, you know, while, you know, you can look at some of the professional racing he's done and, and different things, and you can draw that there might be a good conversation there. Like, you don't know what his experience was. I don't know him really well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he's been certainly a, a – pretty solid fixture around road racing and, and the autocross scene, autocross scene. Um, you know, you heard him talk about Annie Smidgard and I mean, these are, these are powerhouses within, within that scene. So it's always great to be able to have that kind of conversation. For and sure. if you are out there and you are, uh, you know, a road racer, or if you are, um, into autocross or getting your feet wet and you feel like you have some skill, but you're looking to go to that next level, Tom is one of those guys that, I've never, ever, ever heard anybody say anything bad about him. So I think that just having that comfort level that you can go and, and get with Tom and be able to uh, kind of really come away with an incredible amount of feedback and data I think is really incredible. So Sounds good it. to me. That's it. Let's get out of here. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll be back here again next Wednesday when we do this whole podcast thing. Don't forget we have a piece of content coming out on Friday, and we always go live right before this at 2 p.m. Eastern on Wednesdays on Instagram and Facebook. We'll catch you next week.